And with that head on it, what it does is that it takes a portion of that tile drainage as much as it can, and it redistributes that, that tile drainage water out into that perforated tile where it then leaves that perforated tile, enters the riparian soil, the stream bank soil, and then slowly moves through that stream bank soil towards the stream behind us, and then that's where all those microbial processes, processes will remove a lot of that nitrate. So several important design considerations is, uh, one is that we don't want to remove any of the drainage right uh, from the upstream drainage. And so the nice thing about this is that it just has the gate and that any excess water that isn't being distributed out into those tiles just goes over that gates and exits back into the stream. So there's no removal of any of the drainage capacity upstream. Several of the other design considerations we like um, is that one of the things we like to see is that if we have a little bit of slope right next here to the stream. And the reason we like that is that when we put those control structures in there, we're going to raise that water level to a foot below the ground right here. And we, if you take that back towards the field, we like to make sure that, that that raised water level, the footprint of that raised water level, stays within the buffer. So that is, we're not moving any of that water back uh, into the field. We're not backing up any of that water into the field. So water quality uh, improvements have been impressive. To be honest with you, um, it's, it's worked way better than we ever thought. Um, in this site, um, uh, we see that of the water that gets into the riparian soil, virtually all 90 plus percent of that nitrate is removed before it hits the stream. The total amount of nitrate that is removed from this tile that's, that's uh, draining the land uh, in, fr behind, in front of me um, is limited by how much water we can get into that drainage line. Um, so all of the drainage, all of that water that we can get into that distribution line, we're going to remove that nitrate, but then how much can we get into that drainage line? That differs by how much the flow of the tile, how episodic that tile is, the type of tile drainage that's in the field. But in this case, on an annual basis over the last 10 years, we've been removing about, we've been uh, redistributing about 40% of that nitrate, of that tile water has been moved down that distribution line. So in total, over that 10 years, we've been removing about 40% of that nitrate that would have entered that stream um, has been processed by this, uh, by this riparian buffer. So uh, I suggest rather than just, you know, relying on, on uh, what I'm saying about the history of our water quality results, let's take a look. Uh, so what uh, Dr. Beck, what Billy Beck has in his hand right there is a nitrate test strip. And so he's going to just take that test strip and put it down into the uh, control structure and dip it into that water. And then we're going to wait a minute and we'll see what the concentration of nitrate is. And then we will move down to one of the wells and see what it looks like after it moves through the soil. Okay, so how do we measure then? We will get the concentration of nitrate that we see in the control box, which is the tile drainage concentration. But how do we measure the effectiveness of the buffer? Well, in a number of locations, upstream and downstream, we have a transect a series of wells that go between where the distribution line is and the stream. And so this is an example of just a two inch PVC well. We take the cap off. One of the things we see here is a long line. And then that's a pressure transducer, and we use that to measure the depth to the water, and so we can see that water table fluctuation. And then for water quality sampling, we just have a plastic tube with a perforated baler on the end, and we place that down into the well. And then you just start bailing on it, and the pressure will bring the water up, and Billy has a test strip that's ready to go and he's going to dip that into that and then we will wait a minute and we'll compare it to what we saw within the control structure. Okay, so then we have the two test strips, the one that came from the control box and the one that came from this well. And so the way you estimate the concentration of nitrate is that you just have this color scale on, on the side of the tube. And then you just move that up and down and compare it. And so, Billy, where are we? That's 11, 23. You want to estimate so in between there? It's just somewhere in between. Say 20. So maybe about 20 parts per million nitrate as nitrogen and so then this is the one that we got from the well and we're probably about what 25 feet from the uh, distribution line and if we estimate that we're 
What would you say there? Under five. Under five milligrams yeah. per liter. So we've already reduced it um, by a significant amount just in 25 feet. Okay, Tom, go ahead and, and start. All right, will do. So uh, I'll echo the uh, Jackie and, and Billy's comments. First of all, um, welcome and uh, thanks for joining. Um, the one thing that Billy and I were having sort of a private chat here a little bit ago is that we were lamenting that we were doing this on a virtual field day on uh, probably one of the most gorgeous days in June that we're going to have. We wish we had everybody out at the site. Um, so uh, we'll be happy to take some questions, but before we do that, a couple of points I do want to make is I do encourage you to try to go out and take a look at that introduction video that we put out there. It gives a little bit of history of the Bear Creek watershed. And so we've been working up in the Bear Creek watershed since 1990. Hard to believe that's over 25 years. First envisioned by my colleagues Dick Schultz and, and, uh, and Joe Coletti. And we established this, buff, this uh, um, saturated buffer in 2010. Um, one of the things I also do in that introductory video is that I have to give credit where it's due. Um, the idea, the original idea for a saturated buffer came from my close colleague and good friend Dan James. Uh, Dr. Dan James recently retired from the USDA National Lab for Ag and Environment was the one who said, hey, um, uh, what do you think about this idea? And then we reached out to our landowners within the watershed and, and uh, we uh, in this case, so shout out to our landowners, we were originally working with the fathers of the two gentlemen that uh, now operate the land. And so now um, it's two cousins that are operating it. So we've been working with this family since 1995 and they've been really good. So if you think about that, here we are approaching these folks and we're saying, we have an idea. We've never tried this idea. We think it will work. We're not sure. We hope it doesn't have any negative impacts, uh, but would you be willing to try it? And of course they said, absolutely. Um, and then they've been great cooperators ever since. Uh, another person I need to give a quick shout out to is, is uh, Kent Hikins, who's a technician with National Lab for Egg and Environment. He's the one that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, really is the, the machine and, and the person who really um, keeps us running um, with all our sites out there. So we started with this site um, and um, Early cooperators, early funders were the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Then we expanded to projects across the state, water quality projects as the uh, Iowa Water Quality Initiative got up and running. Um, so then uh, and other early supporters were the Iowa, and consistent reporters have been, supporters have been the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. So then uh, from this early one, uh, we worked with the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, got a conservation practice standard up and running, interim conservation practice standard, a full conservation practice standard, and now it's cost shared, as you'll hear through a number of different programs. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's really gaining traction. That's good to see is that uh, there's a number of sites that are really, the, the rate at which these sites are getting implemented across the state in the upper Midwest is on the increase. All right, Tom, I've got a couple questions that have come in. Can you remind everyone where Bear Creek Watershed is located? Uh, sure, so the Bear Creek Watershed starts mostly up in Hamilton County, um, drains through Story County, um, goes right through Roland, Iowa, and enters the South Skunk River just north of, uh, uh, just north of Ames. So it's in Hamilton and Story County in Central Iowa on the Des Moines Lobe. All right, I've had another question come in so far. It's, what is the hydraulic conductivity of the buffer soil at this site? Ah, that's a, that's, that's a good question. So that's an important thing. I won't bother getting into, if, if you have a specific question in terms of the units on that, I'll be happy to address that question in a, in a, a private email. Um, but to stay out of the weeds for most folks, that's, a, that's an important thing. And that's one of the limiting factors. Because one of the things that I mentioned um, was that um, there's a the the stream by these near streamside soils. These riparian soils have a really large capacity, a great capacity to remove that nitrate. What we're limited by is how much water we can get into that soil. That is limited by that term, that saturated hydraulic conductivity. That is how fast can the water move through that soil from the distribution line uh, to the stream. And so that is one of the things that does limit um, the the rate at which we can remove nitrate. But I'll be happy to answer specific questions on that um, um, in an email. Next one. 
Is there an outlet on the saturated buffer tile that can be opened to provide sediment removal for, of the tile system? Ah, that's also an excellent question. So the conservation practice standard as it exists right now um, does not recommend installing saturated buffers in areas where there are surface inlets, either in ponded depressions, um, uh, tile inlet terraces and others. And for that reason, um, uh, and that's the concern of maybe bringing in stover, other trash sediment, uh, and potentially plugging that up. Um, there is um, a, a proposed standard that's out there for review right now um, that might um, change that a little bit if, this, if, the, uh, if those inlets are protected enough, but it's a still a good question. And so uh, just this last year on an ISU farm near Ames, we did install exactly what was described and that is where we had an area that we had surface inlets, a number of surface inlets. We had that traditional control structure you saw, the distribution line. And then at the end of that distribution line, we put in another control structure and then an outlet, a new outlet from that structure to the stream. And we maintain the water in the tile by keeping that, um, keeping those controls, those gates um, um, on that one high, so it keeps it in, in that distribution line. But we do then have the ability to, under high flows, if we want to flush it out, open up that gate, allow that water to go through that distribution line and out through that new outlet. So that's a really good question. That's what I have so far in the chat. I want to welcome everyone uh, to unmute and ask your question as well. Uh, but we'll give it another couple seconds and then we'll play video number two. Well, thanks, Tom, and thanks, Liz. Um, that was a great recap of the power of these practices in their uh, nitrate end removal. Uh, the next couple videos, we're going to focus a little bit more on kind of the compound benefits. So, beyond nitrogen, what do they provide the landowner, uh, the stream channel, the watershed, the soil, um, everything kind of beyond that, that initial. Um, uh, parameter we talked about. So with that, uh, we'll start the next video. Well, good morning. My name is Billy Beck. I'm the Extension Forestry Specialist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. I'm also with the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management at Iowa State University. Really excited to be here today. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, edge of field practices, like Tom mentioned before. You've got the nitrate removal capability, but you've also got all the other compound benefits that these um, perennial vegetation practices provide to not only water quality, but the landowner, wildlife, as we're gonna see as we go on here today. This is a really good spot to talk about kind of the benefits of diversity in riparian plantings. This tree that I'm standing right next to here is silver maple, Acer saccharinum. It's one of my favorite trees. Uh, it doesn't get a lot of love or a lot of hype or a lot of press, but it's a very common riparian tree in, in, in Iowa. Beautiful gray bark, bright red conspicuous buds in the winter. And as you flip the leaf over, it's got a brilliant silver color, which it gets its name from. So if you notice, this buffer is almost entirely silver maple. And not only is it entirely silver maple, it's silver maple of the same age and about the same height and the same size. So it's really lacking in compositional diversity and structural diversity. And there's nothing wrong with that because a lot of species like cottonwood, silver maple, early colonizers typically grow in these kind of monocultural stands. And they're doing wonders for water quality, they're doing wonders for wildlife, and they're doing wonders for value to the landowner. But if we do mix it up and incorporate different species into these zones, you're going to really see the benefits to all three kind of go up. You're going to see much more structural diversity if you plant different species in here. That's good for songbirds and other wildlife to utilize those uh, multitude of new habitats. Also, for the landowner, the more species you have in here that get incorporated, the more potential you have for sustainable income over the long term. Lastly, and this is the one thing I always stress, is diversity leads to resilience. So the more diverse stands we have out here, the more resiliency we're going to see against any kind of climatic shifts in the future or emerging forest health and pest threats that may come about. So a lot of great species can grow in these riparian or streamside zones. And again, like Tom's going to mention and we've mentioned earlier, the soils here in these riparian areas can be very uh, heterogeneous, very diverse. So working with a professional forester is going to be really key to getting the right species for the right sites to meet your objectives for water, uh, wildlife, and, and sustainable on farming. With these smaller streams, they're incredibly reliant on the adjacent riparian area for annual inputs of energy, like carbon and organic matter, but also substrate 
in the form of woody material delivered by these trees for aquatic habitat and just heterogeneity and diversity within the channel. So this is one thing that uh, is often overlooked is when you look about, okay, what's the value of woody riparian vegetation? One of the things that is, again, often overlooked is that they do provide great value in stream to aquatic biota, fish, invertebrates, for the simple fact of providing this. It's just woody substrate delivery into the channel every year. If you ever buy one of these places, snag a handful of this stuff, it's alive with life and trapped organic matter and little invertebrates and, and minnows and everything. So this is a really criti critical um, benefit that establishing woody perennial vegetation along streams uh, provides. Another really neat thing that it does is when materials such as this and even entire trees, when they fall into the channel, they provide a, uh, or they lead to a very diverse channel bed and channel shape. They have very different velocity patterns eddies and all kinds of other things that develop scour pools and just again add to the diverse habitats available for in-stream uh, biota. Another great contri contribution of woody material and trees uh, to the channel and the water itself is the fact that it's a very sunny day but we're under this great shade right now and you can see a lot of the channel is actually under heavy shade and what that does is it regulates any kind of temperature swing we could see uh, from night to day and that links to dissolved oxygen as well and it makes a much more buffered uh, uh, situation as far as dissolved oxygen and temperature for the aquatic invertebrates, aquatic biota and whatnot too. So stream shade, another great benefit uh, of riparian woody vegetation. And again, it's all about your objectives. Uh, this is one of the great things that, that trees provide. Well, I'm standing in one of my absolutely favorite parts of the landscape and that's the stream side or riparian area. Riparian area is just a fancy name for along a stream or river. It comes from the Latin riparius, so uh, feel free to use that to impress your dinner guests over the holidays. But I just want to stress how important, and Tom mentioned this before, how critical these areas of the landscape are in terms of water quality. And I think that importance even gets more significant in the intensively managed uh, watersheds in the agricultural Midwest here. These uh, strips of perennial vegetation are literally buffer um, the water and the water quality in our streams and rivers from the management practices and the results of those management practices we have in the uplands. It's absolutely critical for these zones to be properly functioning uh, to have a, a positive effect on our, on our water quality and quantity. And when I say po uh, properly functioning, I'm really talking at the base is that they're established with native perennial vegetation. That is absolutely critical. Trees or native grass or some kind of perennial, as we'll get to later, is absolutely critical. And there's, there's research here in Bear Creek, right from Bear Creek, that says you don't need to plant a mile of this vegetation to do a lot of good. A little bit goes a long way. But I really want to stress too, the wider you get, the greater those effects of this perennial vegetation are going to be on water quality. And also, uh, the more impact, the more benefits you're going to see, you're going to add benefits as you get wider, not only to water quality, but wildlife and, as, and to you as a landowner through sustainable sources of income and, and any other kind of objectives you might have for the landscape. All right, we're about a half mile downstream from the original uh, silver maple buffer. And you can really see a difference uh, as far as diversity here. And whenever I'm in the woods, I look for two things uh, right off the bat, is that's uh, compositional diversity or what species assemblage is out there and also structural diversity. Structural diversity is kind of how the components of the forest are laid out both vertically and horizontally. So right here, we've got A, way more uh, compositional diversity. We've got a variety of lilacs, viburnums, the shrub component is here. We've got silver maple again, but we also have black walnut, river birch, swamp white oak. So again, a myriad of really great species that provide uh, multiple benefits for wildlife, the landowner. And just looking around here, you can see there's more, more, more structural diversity than we had in that silver maple kind of monoculture back there. Again, both great for water quality, but these just have so much more compound benefits when you add the, the diversity in here. So from top to bottom, you know, you've got this kind of woody component in the mid story here, but was absent with the silver maple. You've got this shrub edge, great for birds and other wildlife here on this component. So again, this is a great example of, you know, what uh, adding diversity can do uh, to these riparian plantings. All right, so when you've got all these trees and shrubs of different heights and shapes and densities, that really adds a lot of niche habitat uh, to the landscape. So much more wildlife species, and especially songbirds and migratory birds and whatnot, breeding birds, can utilize these different areas, the top of the trees, the mid-story, the understory, and then the, the buffer edge. We've added much more complexity to this planting, so you're gonna attract much more greater diversity of wildlife. And again, if you're looking for sustainable income as we go down the road, 
you've got uh, potential from nuts, uh, timber, uh, hunting, you know, just or just even general aesthetics for a nice place to, to spend with your family. So uh, this is, again, a really nice example of added diversity and, and the benefits you see to wildlife, landowner, and water quality. All right. Well, um, again, just kind of stressing that there are a great amount of uh, incredible species that work well in these systems. But really, um, working with a professional forester is absolutely key, as kind of Tom alluded to, and I did as well. The soils in these areas can be very heterogeneous. They can change within a foot of, of elevation change, um, drainage changes as you move back from the channel. Um, so it's absolutely critical to really match the species to the site uh, and then match those to, to the objectives that you have for the landscape. So, and again, working with a professional forester is, is really key uh, to matching those up. So um, again, there's a lot of species out there. We saw a few, but um, it's kind of like when you move back from the channel, the species assemblage tends to change in general. Um, so there's a lot of great things that'll work out here near the channel where it's frequently flooded and inundated. You've got you know black willow, sandbar willow, as you move back where the drainage is a little bit poor, but you get a less lower flood frequency. You've got things like silver maple, sycamore, river birch, cottonwood, swamp white oak, bur oak, pin oak. And as you get up, maybe a little bit higher elevation where there's nice, uh, fairly drained soils, well, nice drained soils. You get your black walnut potential, Kentucky coffee tree, shell bark hickory, pecan, catalpa. So a lot of great species work here but it's all about matching them uh, to the site and the soils and the flooding, flooding intensity. So Billy, I asked you this question when we were out there, but I'll go ahead and ask it again. So that we planted that first site in 1995 and admittedly, you know, it's a monodominant stand of silver maple. That second site that you were at was planted, um, I think in 2003, if I recall, and it sort of reflects our evolution and what, in, in what we were doing for design of these things and increasing the diversity and, and uh, reducing some of the spacing. If a landowner um, sort of had a site that looked like the first one and wanted to enhance that site for some of the benefits um, that you described, uh, what sort of management would you recommend in that case? That's a great question. Um, for that site in general that we saw first with the silver maple, I would, uh, I tend to, it's getting a, a little bit crowded. I tend to thin it out, uh, let some sunlight to the forest floor, uh, but silver maple responds very nicely to thinning. I would add some diversity, some shrubs on the edge there uh, to kind of get that again, structural diversity uh, for habitat. But it, it really varies. A lot of the species that grow in riparian areas are, you know, tend to favor even age management. So they, they love sun, they uh, develop very quickly after disturbance. So if you were to promote certain species like silver maple and cottonwood, um, you would have to actually remove a large swaths of those to allow for the seed and the seed bed and the sun to, to come in there. But um, yeah, it really depends on the species assemblage. But um, for that silver maple buffer, I think it needs some thinning and to add some, um, some diversity, some shrubs on, on the edge there. But again, it's, it's, a, it's about your objectives. If you're looking for more oak or, or something else, uh, your tactics would change. So. All right, so a couple tree related questions. Are chestnuts suitable for riparian buffers? That is a very good question. Um, I don't know a lot about chestnuts. I know they're a great source of income. Um, I would say they'd be good in well-drained soil, but not so much in poorly drained soil. But I, let me get you that answer. I will get that. Uh, so shoot me an email because um, I'm very interested in that too. Hazelnuts are, are an alternative. Those are a, a profitable nut that do well in riparian zones. Uh, aronia berries, elderberries, um, things like that as well. But chestnuts, I would say they're more upland, more well-drained, but let me, uh, let me confirm that. I'm new to, to the chestnut world, so. And in that vein, you mentioned walnut, but what other nut and or timber trees are suitable as potential cash crops? Yeah, again, uh, based on your site and soils, but it, you've got oak, you've got a variety of hickories, uh, silver maple, cottonwood, those are both great timber species. They're not as highly valuable as black walnut, um, but we do harvest them frequently. So 
uh, silver maple, cottonwood, um, variety of oaks, variety of hickories. Um, yeah, it's, it's, there's a pretty diverse assemblage there. And I shared a, a message from someone with the group about chestnuts definitely liking well-drained soils. Okay. I didn't know, but I guessed right. So, <laughs> but again, there's, there's aronia berries, there's hazelnuts, elderberries. Um, there's a wide range of things that, that can do well, that are native, provide a benefit to wildlife and potentially a source of income uh, for the landowner. So. Another question came in, how large in acres or miles is Bear Creek drainage in those counties that you mentioned? Ooh. So maybe that's I more of a Tom question. That's a Tom question, yes. Yeah, it's, it's about um, 30 square miles in total. Um, it, it starts way up at the top, or, or it starts in Hamilton County, not way up at the top, but it starts in Hamilton County, um, it has an east and a west, and where we are, we're about, oh, I'd say a third of the way down. Um, and um, it's a second order stream in that case. Um, one thing that's interesting about it is that the, so the sort of uh, the east side of Bear Creek is the Altmont Moraine. So um, unlike a lot of the landscape right around it, if you look at that specific site, there's actually some pretty good slope in there and the channel narrows up a little bit, the valley narrows up a little bit. And that's because you're on the edge of that Altmont Moraine, the old glacial feature. Um, and then as you, uh, we really um, don't see um, much for historic woodland vegetation um, until you get down really below Roland in the lower third. Um, in fact, um, a thesis was done early on and looked at the surveyor notes. And in that location where we are, um, there probably was not a perennial stream prior to uh, European settlement and the conversion to agriculture. And it was probably more of just a swale um, that conveyed water during snowmelt events uh, or runoff events. All right, so I, there's a couple more questions that came in, but I think they're gonna be more connected with our next video. So we're gonna go ahead and play those and then um, we can address those after this next video clip. So here we're at the site of what we call Bear Creek 2. This one was established in 2017, so it just has a few years of data associated with it. And uh, you can hear the amount of water that's rushing by. And so this drains a lot more acres than that first one. This one drains 150 plus acres. It's hard for us to know because the drainage records aren't very accurate once we get up into the really poorly drained landscape. So a lot of water is moving through it. The other thing is that the buffer, the, the distribution line is much shorter than the first site that we went to. So it has much, it's only 300 feet as opposed to about a thousand feet. So the question is that I'll ask is pose is that, um, is that this site is taking a much smaller percentage, diverting a much smaller percentage of that water into that distribution line. But which site do you think removes over an annual basis more mass of nitrate nitrogen? The answer is, is this site does. And the reason why that is, is that because we are moving, even though it's a smaller percentage of the total, we are moving more water into that line for greater periods of time of the year, we still get about 100% removal once we get into those riparian soils. So this site is actually removes on an annual basis about three times the mass of nitrogen as that first site. So it's important for us to think about when we think about performance of these sites, not just in percent, what percent are we removing, but what we really want to optimize here these sites is for what's that total amount or mass of nitrogen that we are removing. And one of the things that you're going to notice as you look uh, behind Billy and I is that the uh, great difference in the perennial vegetation that's been established over the buffer. In the first site in Bear Creek 1, that riparian forest buffer was already established in 1995, and we came in in 2010 and retrofitted that existing riparian forest buffer with a saturated buffer. In this case, um, this one was established again in 2017, and this was cropped right up to the edge. And so we had the opportunity to plant whatever uh, met the objectives of the land 
landowners um, and other and, and site specific objectives for this site. So in this case, you're going to notice that it's all uh, herbaceous vegetation. It was planted in a high quality pollinator mix, working with our uh, Monarch team, uh, Monarch Iowa State or the Iowa Monarch Consortium. A really nice mixture of diverse um, grasses and forbs. And so as I look around, though we're early in the year and it's not really showy, um, I see the golden Alexander in bloom. I see the rigid goldenrod. I see the gray headed coneflower that's coming in, um, Illinois bundle flower coming in, and a lot of other species. So this is a really diverse mixture. I guess, Tom, I got to ask you, in your experience here with the, the, the native um, pollinator mix and the forest buffer, have you seen any difference in nitrate performance, nitrate removal performance? Because folks ask me all the time, what is the right vegetation to plant along our streams? That's an excellent question. And the answer to the what's the right, from a water quality perspective in a saturated buffer, the right vegetation to plant is whatever meets the landowner objectives. We see no difference in the nitrate removal capacity within these riparian soils, whether it's established to a riparian forest buffer or whether it's established to more herbaceous vegetation like pollinator habitat. The one thing we do see that is different is that um, if we go into an area that was cropped up to the edge like this and put that saturated buffer within here, the nitrate removal is lower in those early earlier years when the field was in crops, until that perennial vegetation gets that opportunity to get those roots down and provide that carbon for the bacteria, it's lower. But difference between vegetations, we're not seeing it. Interesting. So it's more about age than... than it's more about age than it is the composition of the vegetation, so long as it's perennial vegetation and providing that carbon for the bacteria. That's a great point and that folks ask me, you know, trees are grass, trees are grass, trees are grass. I guess we can kind of agree that those, any kind of perennial vegetation along our streams is far superior as far as water quality impact than say row cropping right up to the edge. I'm a little biased towards making sure that's native as opposed to non-native perennial native. vegetation, native. but absolutely I'll yeah. agree with you. Yeah. Well that's another great point. Again, people ask me all the time, what do I plant in, in streamside areas, trees or grass? And it kind of goes back to what are your objectives for the land? A uh, great example here is that you all were talking about earlier, um, we're out here is do you want, say, to promote turkey habitat. Turkeys need tall trees to roost. Um, say you want more of a quail habitat situation, you might want to go more heavy on the on the grass component. So thoughts on that? Yeah, we have actually done some research on that. Sarah Burgess did her master's thesis and published a paper on that where we looked at vegetation of different composition and ages and looked at, at uh, breeding bird response. And uh, what Sarah found was that uh, we went from where it was cropped up to the edge or heavily pastured right up to the edge of the stream. There would be on an annual basis maybe about 12 breeding birds that were in there. By the time that buffer reached um, 10 to 12 years old, we were up almost to 50 bird species that were utilizing that area. And one thing she found is that the old mantra is that what you plant is what you get. She saw that if what your goals are to maybe um, some of our more species of greatest conservation need, our grassland birds, um, if, they, if, you want, if that's what you want to promote, then you want to keep that woody riparian vegetation out and plant this in the herbaceous and grassland vegetation as wide as, wide as you can. If you like more of those edge species, um, like the cat birds um, uh, or the threshers, and maybe like some neotropical migrants coming through, through, then these woody species um, are going to, to, to provide that, that preferred habitat. Pheasants don't seem to care. They'll take either. Um, and the one thing that has surprised us, you mentioned turkeys. We are well up into the headwaters of the Bear Creek watershed right now, and it really surprised us. We routinely see wild turkey up through. We, it's something we never thought we would see. Excellent. All right, so yeah, that's Bear Creek too. And, it, and it's one thing that's nice about this uh, uh, virtual field day is that if we were out there doing a, a regular field day, that's not a site that we often get to. Uh, you're able to take the gang to because it's a little bit farther back and, and uh, we always seem to, to uh, run out of time. And um, the one thing I do want um, to emphasize, um, hopefully a lot of you were on the, uh, uh, on the webinar yesterday for the Iowa Learning Farms and got to listen to uh, Justin Meissen from the Tallgrass Prairie Center talking about establishing perennial vegetation and nice prairie mixes. That was some really great information. Um, 
one of the things that I want to mention um, and is that always the two things that are important are patience and persistence to establish those native vegetation stands. And it's particularly that case within these riparian zones. These riparian zones or streamside zones are by definition high disturbance areas. They get runoff coming into them. Um, they are really, really heterogeneous in their soils. Um, and, and they get flooding in there and all sorts of introductions um, of a lot of weed species. So it's all those management that you're going to put in on a more upland site is particularly important within these riparian zones. Um, to be really persistent and to do your mowing early and make sure you're taking care of any weeds or, or local areas where you have weeds in these areas. We do have some, um, we've been working as I mentioned with our uh, Iowa Monarch Consortium and uh, we've recently have a publication out, an extension publication. It was authored by Steve Bradbury, Dana Schweitzer, and myself. And it's entitled Establishing and Managing Pollinator Habitat on Saturated Riparian Buffers. And so that'll be within the links and encourage if you want some of the details as well as some of the other great publications that are out there. There's one that's specific to on top of saturated riparian buffers. Because the other thing about that is that we're raising that water table in there. So as you put your seed mix together, you're gonna to wanna to go to some of the more music mixes um, and some of those things that are gonna maybe uh, be able to compete a little bit better um, with things like uh, reed canary grass, if, if, such, if such a thing really exists. Hey Tom, Jackie yeah. here. How, how about we uh, let Dan and Dave do their presentation and then we can just open up in general to talk about all of this then. Perfect, let's do it. Keep okay. us on task. That's my job, Tom. I've noticed that. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Haug uh, with Prairie Rivers of Iowa. We're a nonprofit located in Ames, and we uh, work on some watershed projects, uh, Squaw Creek and the larger Saskunk River. Um, one of my jobs at, at Prairie Rivers is GIS mapping, and I want to share with you some mapping tools that can be helpful for landowners in figuring out, is a saturated buffer going to work on my land? Um, so as Tom mentioned, there's a lot of considerations that, that go into that. you got to have enough uh, grade change from the field to the, the stream that you're not backing up water into the field. Um, but you don't want such a steep bank that you're going to risk sloughing when you get it wet. You need enough uh, organic matter in the soil. So a lot of those questions can be answered with uh, LIDAR uh, terrain maps or soils maps. And, and so that's what this tool, the Agricultural Conservation Planning Framework, uh, does. Um, and so I'm going to uh, share two links so, um, that, that uses the ACPF. And one of them... Uh, one of them I'll be sharing with you. The other uh, covers a little larger geographic area. So if, if what I show you isn't, uh, isn't where your land is, check out the other one. Um, so ACPF was uh, developed by Mark Tomer and his team at the USDA Agriculture Research Service. Puts together high resolution terrain, soils, uh, land cover information, try to answer, you know, where's a good spot for a saturated buffer? Where's a good spot for a bioreactor? Various other conservation practices. Um, this uh, toolbox is run at the scale of a small watershed, um, and there are uh, watershed projects all over the Midwest that have, uh, that have used this approach. Um, and so we, we started out with, with our watershed project, Squaw Creek, which extends uh, northwest of Ames, a little bit of Story, uh, Boone, and Hamilton County. Um, and then Story County got interested and wanted to, uh, to run this tool for all the watersheds in Story County. So we've, uh, we now have a, quite a bit of coverage, uh, all of Story County, um, a good chunk of uh, Hamilton, Hardin, uh, Marshall, and Polk County as well. So hopefully there's some of you that are in this area. Um, and there's various ways of, of displaying this information of pot potential spots for conservation. Um, so you might find a a set of maps in a, in a watershed plan um, printed. What we wanted to do was, was to uh, um, have a tool that uh, landowners could zoom into their farm and, and see what some of the options are. Um, and shout out to Jessica Van Horn at, at USDA ARS for showing me how to do this. Uh, and so what we have here is a, a series of tabs that you can, can run through. So find, uh, um, bear with me if this is taking a minute to load. Um, but you know, can zoom into uh, to your farm and look at, okay, are there opportunities on my land for practices like prairie strips that control runoff? Are there existing conservation practices in place? Um, if the fields are tile drained, are there op opportunities for uh, bioreactors or saturated buffers to treat drainage water? Are there opportunities for uh, constructed wetlands? 
And, and then what are uh, some of the design considerations for riparian buffers? Um, and so uh, buffers are great anywhere for, uh, for erosion control. And, and to do that effectively, we're usually looking for 20, 35 uh, feet in, in that range um, to help keep the, the banks uh, from sloughing. And so here in red, I have some areas where, uh, where we don't have that and could, could definitely use a little bit of a buffer for erosion control. Um, and then uh, wider buffers uh, become useful for, uh, become advantageous for water quality in, in two situations. And so you can, can click here to see if that's the case. So, um, you know, are you having a lot of runoff coming in from the adjacent field? Um, and there are gonna be situations like where you have a dredge spoil bank that's gonna prevent uh, runoff from, from making it in, into your buffer. You, you got a big gully uh, going through. So that's, that's one factor. And, and if you have that, a wider buffer is gonna be advantageous and planting that with stiff stem grasses. So this little table here uh, shows kind of the logic of, of the uh, runoff coming in on, on the one hand, and then uh, what's going on in the riparian zone. Do we have a, a low bank, a, a bench where, where, uh, that's, that's, um, where, there, where the roots are gonna be able to reach the water table and take up some of that nitrate? So if you have, a, if you have a, a real steep bank, you're gonna limit that opportunity for nitrate removal. But in this case, we have some good opportunities, enough of a bench to, to benefit from some deep rooted species, some trees that are gonna take up some of that, that nitrate. So that's kind of the, the logic of, of this, uh, those, two, those two factors and get you thinking about where, where on my land is a, a wider buffer gonna be uh, most beneficial for, for water quality in addition to those, those habitat and erosion control benefits. Um, and then uh, over here, um, a lot of these fields are tile drained. So if you got a, a tile going through, um, gonna need a saturated buffer to, to get the most of the, the water quality benefits. And so here in this uh, hatched, we have uh, potential spots for, for saturated buffers according to those uh, criteria, the, the, the uh, grade change, the, the soils that, that, uh, that come into play. Um, and, if, uh, and if it's not showing an opportunity for a saturated buffer, then uh, one of the things ACPF will do is it'll tell you why. So in this case, we have all three of those factors, the, the topography and, and the soils. Um, so of course, uh, GIS mapping doesn't tell you where the tile, uh, tiles are actually located. So we've, we've found some, some issues there. You actually have to, um, have to look at your records or do some on-site investigation, but, uh, but tools like this can be a good starting point to getting you thinking about what are the opportunities on Hey, hey, Dan, Jackie here. For those people not in Story County, um, who can they turn to uh, to maybe do some of this assessment? Sure, um, and uh, I pasted in the chat box um, another link. We have uh, saturated buffers have been, um, opportunities have been mapped statewide, so they can check that out. Um, and, uh, and then also, if you have a watershed project in your area, check with the coordinator and they may know if this has, uh, um, if this has been done as part of a watershed plan, and chances are it has, and they can direct you to where to find that information. All right, now we'll hear from David as he gets his uh, video and microphone unmuted. Yeah, so I'm David Stein. I am the watershed coordinator at Prairie Rivers of Iowa. Um, and since we heard from getting saturated buffers and bioreactors and uh, all sorts of different conservation practices up and running. Um, some things that farmers might need to know next is what's the next step. So I'll talk about uh, our work with doing some technical assistance and working directly with farmers. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have a couple slides, shouldn't take too long. Um, I know we're running a little short on time, so I'll go ahead and just power through those. So what the point of habitat technical assistance is, it's the next step after, say, a farmer or a landowner has decided to go ahead and get started on implementing some conservation on their land. Um, so for Prairie Rivers, we really like to sort of establish a relationship with a farmer and really get to know what the goals of their land are. Um, and what we're mainly concerned about is threatened and endangered pollinators and wildlife. So we work uh, with farmers and landowners to provide some of that habitat for federally endangered species such as the rusty patch bumblebee and state uh, threatened species like the regal fritillary on the right. Um, but these habitats also provide some other benefits for 
uh, threatened reptiles, threatened birds, amphibians, mammals, etc. And beyond that, a lot of these practices also help with soil health and water quality. And we really like to promote the practices that sort of have that Venn diagram right in the middle where all of these different uh, benefits are represented. So our priorities really on the farm would be things like wetlands, uh, prairie strips or contour buffer strips, uh, riparian or saturated buffers, and then habitat restoration uh, that sort of encompasses everything that doesn't fit neatly in those three previous boxes. Um, so we work in a variety of different watersheds. Um, so we work with a lot of different landowners. Uh, in our watersheds, they each have different populations, different demographics, uh, different overseeing jurisdictions, different wildlife that's been seen, um, different land cover, and even different agricultural practices. And within those watersheds, there's even uh, some more diversity at a smaller scale. So currently our service area is in the South Skunk River watershed, the northern portion. So like what Dan said earlier, we work mainly in Story, Boone, and Hamilton counties. And we have smaller uh, priority watersheds within the large South Skunk River watershed. Uh, these include Whirl Creek, uh, which is where Ames is. So we work with urban landowners. We work with uh, more rural landowners on the uh, western edge. Uh, in uh, West Indian Creek, uh, north of Nevada, uh, we work with a lot of real crop producers, and south of Nevada, we work with uh, more uh, topographically varied uh, farmers who mainly raise cattle. And we also have Long Dick Creek up in northern Stor uh, Story County and northern and southern Hamilton County, uh, we work with, again, mainly real crop producers. So how we go ahead and target conservation, uh, we start usually from the office and it's more of like a three-way uh, communication uh, line. So we get, uh, on our end, we go ahead and map some of these practices out using ACPF, what Dan talked about earlier. We also take a look at where some rare and endangered species were found. Um, so we will go ahead and reach out directly to farmers who have a lot of these practices and a lot of these species on their land. Uh, you might have seen a flyer from us in the last couple of years uh, saying what benefits your farm has. Um, but the majority of our outreach and our communication to farmers comes from the farmer side. Uh, so after a field day or after a seminar, we'll get a lot of calls and a lot of emails from farmers who want us to check out their land. And our third way of getting communication out is working with intermediaries like um, soil and water conservation districts, the NRCS, um, and other partner organizations that we work with. And that finally leads us to our boots on the ground uh, technical assistance, which comes in the form of land visits. So this is a one-on-one -on -one conservation service where one of our staff members, usually me, will go out to a farm and work with farmers directly uh, to actually get a view of what is going on on their land. So we will tour the landscape, we'll work with the farmer to actually get out there and see firsthand what is going on. And we'll discuss some goals for the farmer. Uh, usually what this will do is we will talk about where the land has been, where the land is currently, uh, how the land is currently being farmed and where the farmer wants the land to go in the future. Uh, so we really talk about practices first. We really like to get to the conservation benefits for some of these practices out uh, in the farm, in the farmer and landowner's head. Uh, and then we'll worry about the paperwork and the financials later. And we also like to introduce the farmer to their land from different perspectives. So we'll bring in some maps and some data uh, about the landowner's soils. Uh, we'll get to, we'll introduce the landowner to some of the wildlife that's been found in the area or on the land. Uh, we'll introduce them to the ecology of the area uh, prior to row crop or prior to farming. And we'll also introduce them to some different aerial photos from the past 30 to 40 years just to see how their land has changed uh, from the air over time. And finishing up the process, we do provide some financial assistance uh, uh, securing. So we work with our partners at the Soil and Water Conservation Districts and NRCS to find the best financial assistance for landowners to get the most bang for their buck. And then we also continue our technical assistance. So if landowners have questions on how to implement different conservation practices or just have a question on different land uh, management techniques and different species of wildlife, uh, we'll be on call to get their uh, information to uh, the landowner or the farmer uh, for them to use later on. 
So that's all I have for Prairie Rivers. Um, if you are interested in getting uh, some conservation on your land or would like a land visit or would like to reach out to me or Dan, uh, please just let me know. My contact info is here um, and we'll be happy to help you out in the future. Okay, this is Jackie here again, just for those of you who are not in the Skunk River uh, watershed. And so if you're wondering where you can get this kind of assistant, I would uh, look and see if there is a watershed project in your area and reach out to the watershed coordinators in that area. They will know resources and hopefully be able to give you some of the same services that Dan and, and, and Dave are, are giving their folks in that watershed. So that's just a the one challenge of doing these virtual field days is if we were doing this in person, we would have a lot of people from the area and from the watershed area, uh, but instead we've got people from all over the state. So um, let's open this up now to uh, a dialogue with everyone. And actually, I do have a question, Billy, for um, actually for any of you that want to answer it. Um, I know there's no difference with water quality between um, having uh, more of the, uh, the, the grasses and the flowers um, as, a poor, as opposed to the forest, but is there a different benefit for the actual stream if you make a different choice? I'll start, Tom, if you want. I, I'd say definitely. Um, again, we saw how the, the, the stream is more shaded with that forest canopy. Um, if you've got large stream banks, tall stream banks, you want that deep uh, woody rooting material for stabilization. During flood events, you know, those upright stems um, really work to slow down flood velocities, mitigating downstream flood issues. Um, so yeah, the, the woody contribution to the channel itself adds to channel diversity and heterogeneity, both, both the shape of the channel and for aquatic habitat as well. Um, the whole time here, I'm thinking, when everybody asks me that, I'm thinking, ideally, and Tom, you can uh, talk on this too, is you'd want to combine trees, grass, and shrubs to maximize the benefits you get from all three. So um, yeah, they're, they're different. It's not, I, I hate pitting them against each other. They're just, they, they provide different things uh, for different situations and different objectives. Um, but again, all three together, you're kind of maximizing that, that water quality benefit and all the other benefits too, wildlife, uh, on-farm value, everything. So yeah, I'll let um, Tom, you can join, chime in too. Yeah, I, I agree, Billy. You know, we've been long term, long time proponents of that three zone system where at the interface between the crop field and the riparian zone that you put those uh, that herbaceous vegetation, particularly some stiff stem herbaceous vegetation to slow down that water and drop it out and then increase the diversity by planting diverse amounts of shrubs. Um, and, and if it is in the right place, then go ahead and, and uh, plant some of those trees near the stream. Because um, uh, if particularly if you and, and it's going to depend on where you are in the state. Um, some parts of our of our state are more prairie streams uh, may not need that, but particularly if you're in northeast Iowa or southern Iowa um, that have that history of that native riparian vegetation, then yeah, then it's important. Yeah, great point. It, yeah, there's not a blanket statement about trees. They it kind of depends on the site where you are in the in the state. So. Sorry, I forgot I was on mute. I've had a couple questions come in. Um, in relation to the buffers. Is it possible in a wide buffer to establish more of one lateral in a given direction from the distribution box, hopefully to increase nitrate removal? Yeah, yes, um, another great point. Um, we do have now a site that we've established again just this last year where we had a, a, the, a buffer that was plenty wide and we had a tile that was draining uh, quite a bit of area so we had plenty of water where we have put in um, a, a second distribution line. Um, and I think that that will um, improve it. We don't think that it's going to double it um, because I think what we're going to limit it by using that term we said before um, that saturated hydraulic conductivity is going to be limiting it. But yes, um, in those areas where you have enough width and, and can put in a second, second one, we would certainly uh, encourage you to do that. All right, so this one wants to get some maybe real numbers. How is the cost of these land modifications to the farmer balanced by actual realized economic gains? Are there any numbers available? That's a great question. I got that, asked that just the other day and I'm looking into it. It's um, trying to, to, to put a number on forest management over the long term is very difficult. Um, 
but yeah, if you want, shoot me an email because I'm researching that right now. It's going to be a general number and it's very site specific and species specific, but um, for trees, it's, it's tough. So. All right, I've had one come in. Are there special considerations for establishing buffers along streams that have been ditched or channelized? That was instructed at Tom. Uh, let's see. Um, if you are in, are you with, if you are within a, an organized drainage district uh, and they have an easement up against the stream, along the stream, which, which they likely will if it's a ditch, um, then there are going to be some specific rules um, that for, for what you can do. And mostly that's going to be um, probably a restriction in, in many of the woody species uh, within there. Um, I think it was Dan that mentioned that oftentimes you do have maybe a dredge spoil where if they're, if they're, if they, when they dug that ditch and they put it on one side, um, or they did maintenance on that and they put it on one side, you have an area where it's a little bit higher on one side, might restrict some surface runoff. Oftentimes there's an inlet, um, a, a surface inlet that's gonna drain that into the stream. The question where, um, for as far as a saturated buffer, we don't think that's an issue um, because all of that water for the saturated buffer, if you put that tile line, that distribution line, at least 30 feet away from that ditch, all of that water is gonna be moving all down below um, that dredge spoil. So we're not worried in the case of a saturated buffer um, with the existence of that dredge spoil. All right, this is our last question. How effective are buffer strips in non-tiled fields? Um, I think they're talking saturated buffers or just regular buffers? It said buffer strips in non-tile drained fields. Well, I think, um, I, so that my perspective, again, we've been working in the Bear Creek watershed since 1990 and our initial focus was on buffers. Grasses up to the edge, the three zone model that has the shrubs, trees, and herbaceous vegetation. And, and sometimes I think that we forget about buffers as being, um, you know, a sort of an old school um, conservation technology. But I think it's it's probably our first and most important conservation technology up next to the stream. Because as Billy mentioned, you have all those benefits that are layered on there. And then with the saturated buffer, um, really that's a beautiful add-on. So you have this buffer there, um, and then you have that, if you have that tile coming through there and you're moving water through that and short circuiting that buffer um, for nitrate, nitrogen, but you have the opportunity to put in a saturated buffer, you're really just layering on another benefit on top of all those other benefits from those riparian buffers. So Tom, right. without tile, then the buffer itself would get saturated, right? If it's just coming off the field. Without so, so you're, you're redirecting you know that, the tile water. Yeah, that, but that drainage area for Jackie, that drainage area, I think I understand your question, um, that that tile's draining isn't mostly that area right next to the stream. Um, that is providing water from those more upland areas, those more depressional areas, um, that that water may not have ever, in, in, prior to putting that tile in, might not have even made it to that riparian zone. All right. Well, if that is everything, we want to thank everybody for coming today. We want to thank our speakers, Billy, Tom, Dave, and Dan. We appreciate it a lot. Um, I think everybody's willing to do follow-up questions if you have anyone, so feel free to uh, shoot them off an email. Just want to remind you that we do have continuing education um, units available, so uh, there's the information on how you do that. Our next, uh, Liz, do we have a slide for that? Yes, we have a virtual field day. In fact, we've got three weeks in a row now. Next week, we've got Dr. Marshall McDan uh, McDaniel talking about soil health. So we think this is, this is gonna be a great field day. This is our first time of, uh, of partnering with Marshall. So we're pretty excited about that field day. Thanks a lot.